Good afternoon all and uh, welcome to this meeting uh, on the topic of agriculture uh, north and south uh, in, in following uh, Brexit. Um, it's a delight uh, to welcome you all. Uh, my name is Dahil Kelly. I'm chair of the UK group uh, in the Institute and uh, I want to welcome you here. Uh, I'm delighted that we're joined by David Brown, who is the Deputy President of the Ulster Farmers Union, and by Ty Buckley, who is the Director of Policy and Chief Economist of the Irish Farmers Association. Uh, you're both very welcome. Uh, I'll ask them both to speak for about 10 minutes, uh, and then I'll be happy to take uh, questions uh, thereafter. Uh, I'd, um, I'd like to remind you that uh, this session, uh, both the initial 10 minutes from each of our panellists, uh, and uh, the session which follows uh, are on the record. Uh, and uh, please feel free to ask questions. Uh, and I, I put the questions uh, to our speakers as we go along. Let me now formally introduce uh, Mr. Brown and Mr. Buckley. Uh, David Brown is a Deputy President of the Ulster Farmers Union, having been elected in 2018. Uh, within uh, the Ulster Farmers Union, he represents the Southwest Group on the Beef and Lamb Committee. He's also a committee member of the Fermanagh Grassland Club and a Certus Chairman. He's originally from Florence Court, County Fermanagh, uh, where he owns a cattle and sheep farm. Uh, Ty Buckley is the Director of Policy and Chief Economist for the Irish Farmers Association, having been appointed in December 2020. He holds a degree in Agricultural Science from UCD, as well as a Master's of Business Administration from the University of Limerick. Mr. Buckley is also an Nuffield Scholar, a member of the Agricultural Science Association and a qualified financial advisor. He's also actively involved in dairy farm on his home farm uh, in North Cork. So welcome to you both. And may I invite uh, David Brown uh, to tell us how he sees things for about 10 minutes. The floor is yours, David. Thank you very much. Um, I suppose the first thing to say is thank you for the invitation. Uh, I understand uh, our chief executive uh, previously uh, presented to this group uh, back, I suppose, just in the mouth of Brexit. Uh, that has happened, uh, obviously, this year. And I suppose returning to the North-South uh, agricultural cooperation that has existed here in uh, both North and South um, and no invisible barriers uh, was obviously what we were used to. And thankfully, to all intents and purposes, uh, that north-south barrier uh, still is uh, pretty free and open uh, in terms of trade. I suppose first to just quickly acknowledge some of the level of trade. Um, we have somewhere around 2.5 billion litres of milk produced in Northern Ireland. <clears throat> One third of that, uh, which goes south for processing, mainly Lakeland, Glanbia. And I'll return uh, to that point relating to the milk later on. Sheep trade, again, traditionally um, up to half a million, 400 to 500,000 sheep uh, go for slaughter in the south of Ireland. And I suppose there's an inevitability, actually, that some of them, believe it or not, return uh, to the GB marketplace and indeed into mainland Europe. Um, I was on a meeting this morning uh, having some discussion around the significance of the pig trade, uh, because uh, while we've all those sheep going south, we also have uh, roughly an equivalent number of pigs which come north for slaughter. Um, that at, at the minute, uh, just to make you aware, due to labour shortages is proven to be uh, rather a concern because uh, we, we just uh, aren't able to get the slaughter capacity due to the lack of, of labour. Um, so we've accepted, I suppose, what in the past was normal everyday trade uh, pre-Brexit. Thankfully, as I say, that has uh, to the main with uh, Southern Ireland remained uh, pretty much the case. Of course, naturally, we will have variations at times in prices, which will those price differentials will dictate the market and, and the movement of stock north or south. Uh, Brexit, I suppose, on a positive side, has allowed us uh, here in the north uh, to design our own bespoke agricultural policy. Um, the agricultural policy outside of the EU has been devolved to the regions. So England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland are allowed to plan and design their own. Uh, the food and drink sector here in Northern Ireland has an output of over £5 billion uh, sterling with 113,000 jobs. So it's a significant contributor to the Northern Ireland economy, which, like the South, an agricultural economy with a population of uh, just between 1.8 and 1.9 million. 
in Northern Ireland. Uh, Northern Ireland feeds uh, 10 million people in the UK. It is a significant contributor to that uh, deficit uh, of the UK, which is only around 60% self-sufficient in food production. Uh, DERA currently has uh, launched proposals for a new Northern Ireland food strategy framework, I suppose specific to us, which helps um, develop across departmental frameworks. And I suppose it allows local procurement in schools, hospitals, uh, prisons, etc., allowing us to provide uh, safe, healthy, environmentally produced food uh, instead of a policy which in the past maybe was more dictated by the cheap cuts which were brought from wherever uh, to the service sector as well. Uh, I suppose the second part of being outside uh, of Europe and having our own agricultural policy is, and, and Tag may, may dwell on this in perhaps later, but it's reflected in the fact that we're no longer part of the CAP. Uh, so that CAP reform, the Common Agricultural Policy, policy uh, the farm to fork uh, policy, which the EU is now pursuing, targeting things like 25% uh, organic production, uh, reduction in the use of fertilizers and, and uh, plant protection products, um, reduced use of animal health medicines and all of that. Um, th there is a fear naturally there that uh, that will lead to an unprecedented reduction across the whole of the EU in food production and inevitably farmer incomes. And we're outside of that, uh, however, I suppose it's fair to say there are uh, major issues. Those are the things that I suppose we see as, as positives. Uh, England, for example, has developed its own uh, environmental land management scheme, which is not uh, in its rollout, proving that attractive uh, to farmers on the ground. Uh, we are currently working with our own department in terms of developing a future agricultural policy specific to Northern Ireland. But as I say, there are issues relating to, to Brexit and, and the protocol. I'm hoping some of those are going to be solved uh, this evening. I was just checking earlier with the guys that um, uh, Maris uh, Sefcovic wasn't making his speech before I made this one because uh, some of those things may have, have moved ahead. But Northern Ireland, uh, I suppose, became, uh, while it remained part of the UK Customs Territory, it, it also remains uh, in the EU regulatory zone. So therefore, uh, you know, a lot of the rules uh, to do with standards uh, which apply in the EU, uh, we are still uh, applied uh, here in Northern Ireland. So mainland GV is, is now regarded as a third country. Um, it has led to major difficulties, I would say, in the GB to Northern Ireland trade. Over 50% of our trade in the opposite direction is with GB and some commodities, for example, beef, uh, you know, it's, it's over 80%. And the talk of unfettered access uh, to our internal marketplace, our most important marketplace. Um, yes, to an extent that that is true. However, there is additional documentation, additional paperwork and checks and so forth. And those all add cost. Uh, and naturally, as, as we always find in life, those costs get passed back down and, and, and inevitably end up uh, with the producer. But UFU, Ulster Farmers Union, uh, represent around 11 and a half thousand farming families. And uh, we did a survey in the past. There's roughly 2.6 family members involved. Uh, some of those businesses or family memberships actually might have a poultry unit and a dairy unit or, or you know, beef and sheep or whatever as well. So there's a, a, quite a number of, of enterprises across uh, you know, some of those farm businesses. But we represent all farms and we're non-political. So we steer clear of the constitutional uh, discussions and debates around the protocol. Um, and yet, a couple of weeks ago, I was invited uh, to make representations to the Finance Committee up at Stormont uh, for a submission on the Northern Ireland Protocol. And, and we present at that point, I suppose, those things which are issues for us. And I'm happy to enter into discussion later on, on those, but I'll just quickly uh, list uh, off maybe some of the things that really, in the interest of time, I, I don't want to dwell on uh, in detail, but uh, if you wish to come back to them, please do. But for example, <clears throat> we knew this from the end of last year that um, breeding sheep, uh, which were normally bought across mainly in Scotland, um, have been prevented from coming. So there was sheep actually bought last, last autumn, 2020, before uh, Brexit happened on the 1st of January. Those farmers anticipated that they could get them um, uh, across. They couldn't be brought across until the 1st of January because there's uh, scrapey, which is a, um, a disease of sheep, which had to be uh, checked for and in effect they had to be a year old so the sheep were bought 
Uh, they would normally have been grazed on Scottish farms and then brought over after the 1st of January. Those sheep, uh, some of them were sent for slaughter. Others are still in Scotland and have had to be resold because they simply could not be got back into Northern Ireland. We also had a six month uh, residency period uh, for Northern Ireland um, breeders, livestock uh, that would be brought across maybe to sales or shows. Those livestock uh, have to, if they go across uh, currently to Northern Ireland, would have had to stay for a six month period. We hope these things are being worked on and perhaps maybe in time we will get uh, alleviations, but you know, 10 months on, we're still in the same place. Growers, another example, unable to get seed potatoes, unable to get cereal seeds this autumn because they need certification coming from a third country into effectively EU regulatory zone. That has reduced the number of varieties and, and seeds that they can get and increased the cost. Horticulture, uh, plants, um, there was massive disruption and still is uh, to uh, the SPS checks, sanitary and phytosanitary checks that need to take place. Um, and, and indeed, you may have picked up on, on TV and radio back earlier in the year where this whole debacle existed around plants that had soil on their roots uh, and, and suppliers just gave up uh, trying to get them to Northern Ireland. So we lost we lost that producer base machinery and agricultural parts. Again, uh, time time important. They need to be got probably 24 hours delivery. Um, those have been delayed. Uh, customs checks and, and checks on, on uh and, and I suppose really uh, fundamentally those things which are first and foremost in the farmers' minds, uh, uh, they, they sort of uh, trickle down to, to people who couldn't get particular items that they normally got through Amazon or direct deliveries or whatever. Plant protection products, I'll just give, quickly give you an example of that. Uh, back in the summertime, our vegetable sector uh, had an aphid spray, very important spray in order to keep the aphids at bay called Topeki. The EU um, uh, decided that uh, that was no longer uh, allowed to be used. Um, the UK, you know, still using it, or GB, sorry, still using it, but Northern Ireland could no longer use it because we, again, within that regulatory zone. That might not seem a big issue because the, initially we thought, well, surely there are products then in ROA that we can use instead. Um, but that uh, turned out not to not be the case because uh, those products need to be licensed by the Chemicals Regulation Division in the UK. So in other words, we could put it on our carrots or, or on our potatoes or whatever, um, but we could not then sell it uh, because it was that product, ROI product was not maybe licensed by CRD, uh, the Chemical Regulation Division in the UK. So rather than finding ourselves in the best of both worlds, we found ourselves in no man's land, veterinary medicines, same as human medicines, and I said earlier that I would uh, return to the milk and um, rules of origin around milk uh, became and, and still is an issue. Uh, like Simon Coveney and those in the Irish government and, and no doubt the IFA are well enough aware of this. Um, if you've got uh, something to put on a shelf uh, and it is um, described as mixed origin, it's not, it's not a great label to have attached to it. Uh, albeit uh, a lot of those third countries uh, that that was being supplied to by Lakeland, for example, uh, as a co-op, they were sent in powders and so on uh, to third countries outside of the EU. Uh, in, in the main, those countries have accepted that mixed origin product uh, and, and continue to take it. Um, but it's, it's still not a solution. So I suppose to, to sort of quickly summarize, all of these are, are, are real problems. Um, we have 2,800 checks per week done at our ports uh, uh, coming in uh, that didn't previously exist. And uh, you're probably perhaps aware that there has been an extension of grace periods. Uh, those are something the UK requested and, and they have been extended. Uh, if those grace periods had not been extended, uh, the number of checks uh, would have risen to somewhere in the region of 15,000 per week, which is 20%. Uh, I mean, basically we're, we're, we're more checks. Uh, I would have had more checks coming into Northern Ireland than they have in, in Rotterdam, one of the largest ports in the world. And um, that just is, is simply unmanageable. So um, there is, as you may well know from the news even today, discussions that have been ongoing for some months with the EU about trying to find uh, solutions to that. But if I could leave you with this uh, analogy, uh, you know, of why the protocol in Northern Ireland has been perceived to be so difficult, I suppose if you're somebody who enjoys uh, your cup of coffee, and um, perhaps you were told that, sorry, from the 1st of January 2022, you can no longer have it. 
um, you know, there will be no more coffee, you would perhaps feel you'd lost something. You might feel that um, that ruling was unfair or, or unreasonable. However, on the other hand, if you were told you can still have your coffee, um, you perhaps might not think that you'd gained anything because that was just normal. And that's the difficulty we have with the agricultural industry where um, ultimately uh, the things which we do still have, and I very much uh, recognize and acknowledge them in terms of the trade we continue to have with the EU, those are things which were normal. So therefore they're not seen as gains, but those things which we have lost uh, are certainly to the foremost of our farmers' minds. So I'll conclude at that and uh, hand back to the chair. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, David, for a, um, a very wide ranging uh, few minutes. I'm grateful. Uh, may I now ask Tyg for his views? Tyg, I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, and, um, and thanks for the opportunity. And uh, it's, uh, I presume when you were organizing this, you fully expected to uh, have Lord Frost and Commissioner Sefcovic speaking uh, uh, just around the time that you had the event. So I'm impressed with your prescience. Um, so I suppose just to, to say, I think a lot of what I am planning to say here, David has actually covered uh, an awful lot already. And, I, you know, I'd share an awful lot of, 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 uh, of the views that David has, has outlined in terms of the importance of North-South trade, first of all. So I suppose before, in terms of the, just to recap, really, I mean, Brexit, posed and you know arguably arguably still continues to pose a very substantial threat to Irish agriculture uh, from our perspective uh, our exports agricultural exports to the UK uh, represented 34 percent of all our agricultural exports in 2019 and a 44 percent of beef you know so a massive part of it hugely important for three real reasons first of all it's a high value market uh, second of all similarly similar dietary trends and third of all, it's close proximity. So it's a huge important market to the to, to Irish uh, farmers. And then as, as David has already covered, the uh, trade between uh, um, the south and north of the border, it's, it's quite integrated as, as David has outlined, massive chunk of milk coming south to be processed. Um, 360,000 lambs from the, south, from the north came south in 2020. You know, in 2020, in this year, year to date, about 60,000 live cattle have gone up to the north, which is up over a quarter on last year and substantially up in 2019. About 10% of our pigs are, are, are go north as well, as David has, has said, and, you know, notwithstanding the challenges that are there at the moment from a labour perspective, which is, is proving very challenging in terms of slaughtering capacity. But as well as that, you know, in terms of, from a disease perspective, an all-Ireland approach is, vi is vital because, I mean, disease in terms of animal or other type diseases, they, they would not respect any borders. So having an all-Ireland approach on that side is, is, is vital as well. And I suppose, thankfully, the, the protocol and the trade and cooperation agreement alleviated the worst threats of Brexit from both a tariff perspective and in terms of the north-south trade, notwithstanding the issues that David has outlined, one of them being very much uh, related to the mi goods of mixed origin issue, uh, which David covered in terms of the importance of it from a dairy perspective, and also from a, in terms of whiskey as well, where a, you know a chunk of, a, of of whiskey is is blended whiskey as well, so it suffers from the same issues that uh, as as related to dairy in terms of it not being recognised as as an eligible good from in terms of uh, gaining access to the to the EU free, free trade agreements and potentially an issue too should uh, intervention be an option for dairy where those products that are blended origin may not at the moment would not be eligible to go into intervention. So that, that is certainly an issue that 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 continues to be uh, uh, a very topical and, and we would uh, certainly be hoping that would be sorted to find a solution to it. And um, I suppose it is important to say that from an Irish agriculture perspective, I don't think we've yet been fully uh, we've been fully exposed to the impacts of Brexit because there has been a postponement of SPS checks and the recent uplift in commodity prices, which, uh, and, uh, and David again alluded, alluded to it, the price changes uh, across the different marketplaces do tend to drive some of the trade flows uh, north-south with regard to, to livestock. And I suppose at the moment we are going through, a, you know, a a positive cycle in terms of commodity prices and I would be concerned to a certain extent that the industry might be being 
you know, have a false sense of security in terms of what we've seen post Brexit, because as there, a lot of the checks have, have yet to be fully implemented. And until that happens, we won't fully appreciate the impact it has. But it has already had specific impacts, you know, negative impacts for us uh, when I'm talking about Irish farming. I mean, first of all, we've seen, a, you know, sterling is devalued by 10 percent over that period. Farmers are price takers. So that is an impact for us. We look at the future UK potential for the UK to do trade deals. We've seen the Australian trade deal already signed, where there's potentially going to be 110,000 tonnes of beef coming in, 75,000 tonnes of lamb, 48,000 tonnes of cheese, which is obviously a, a, a big uh, threat for Irish agriculture. And as well as that, with a potential softening of the of, of SPS standards in the UK down the road, we would be looking to see is, is, is it a potential trade uh, deal with Mercosur countries on the on the horizon in the long term but also i suppose it's important to say that ireland lost a very close ally in the eu also uh, in terms of agricultural policy with the departure of the uk from the eu um, because we were closely aligned in terms of policy and in fairness i'm not that long in the ifa but i do know that the ifa has worked very closely with david and his colleagues in the eu a few over years and have a very good working relationship but in terms of our own bilaterals and also at EU level with their involvement in the COPA farming or umbrella farming of army organizations as well. So that was a real loss for, for Irish agriculture as well. And especially when we, we face into the, the challenges that we, we have with farm to fork, which is going to prove to be very, very challenging for Irish and European agriculture in terms of trying to achieve those objectives and the likely in, impact it's going to have on production, food security and, and farm incomes. I suppose, even despite Brexit, UK consumers continue to see Irish food in a very positive light, which is which is important. Recent Red Tractor research of UK consumers identified that Ireland was the most trusted country among UK consumers for beef, chicken, dairy, and pork uh, product, which is very, I suppose, important for us that we retain that 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 that, that Ireland continues to be viewed in that fashion from a, a agricultural exports point of view. So I suppose I just to, to, to conclude, Chairman, I mean, agriculture faces massive challenges, you know, particularly on the climate side of it, uh, which we are we are really grappling with in, in the South at the moment. I know in Northern Ireland, David is facing very similar challenges with his organization too. We cannot afford to have a trade dispute taking place in the midst of all this. And I think, you know, it's because of that that we need to make sure that we can that issues that are there at the moment are resolved in a in a in a you know in a fashion that addresses the issues that are there for for all stakeholders and allows us to move forward because i mean we've endured five years of uncertainty since brexit uh, was first uh, uh, the referendum took place and for all concerned i think we need clarity certainty and stability going forward for the good of all involved in agriculture both north and south of the border thank you chairman